on your radio, on Global Player and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. The Cabinet Office says it's received Boris Johnson's unredacted WhatsApp messages requested by the COVID inquiry and are now looking at it. The government had previously claimed it didn't hold all of the evidence, but the former Prime Minister says it was submitted several months ago. The government's latest plans to help families on universal credit get back into work is being criticised by the childcare sector. From the end of June, they'll be able to claim almost 50% more funding to go towards nursery or childminder costs. But the industry is warned it'll only place increased pressure on an already limited number of spaces. Angela Jane Andrea is an early years consultant and has told LBC she's fed up of ministers providing sticky plasters. So their current scheme of, of free education isn't free at all. It's underfunded. It's not paid for. Um, it doesn't cover the cost to nurseries, but the nurseries have to provide it for free. So it's a vicious circle. This is why there's this never-ending issue of people saying it's too expensive because costs have to go somewhere, so they go on to the younger children, which, of course, is, is not funded by government. A US court will hear a challenge over Prince Harry's American visa next week after he admitted to previously using drugs in his autobiography. A think tank in the States is demanding his immigration records are released. Past drug-taking can potentially stop people being granted the right to live there. Smoke from a huge wildfire in the Scottish Highlands in which two firefighters have been injured can be seen from space. It's covered more than three square miles and has been burning for four days now. The Scottish government's promised to raise awareness. And British tennis number one Cameron Norrie's through to the third round of the French Open in Paris. He eased to a straight sets victory over home player Luca Puy. Novak Djokovic is in action later as well. LBC markets report the FTSE 100 closed down 75 points at 74.46. The pound buys $1.23 and one euro 16. LBC weather still lingering cloud around, particularly in the east and far north, spreading westwards tonight. Staying clear, though, in the far west, breezy in the south, with a low of 5 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Serena Farrow. Says it's this fault. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. This is Cross Question. Good evening, I'm Ali Mirage. You're listening to LBC and this is Cross Question. Joining me on the panel this evening are Yasmin Alibi-Brown to my left on the uh, on the on the, on the far left, actually, <laughs> author and political commentator. Uh, next to her, also on my left, is Susan Hall, a Conservative London Assembly member, also a potential candidate for next year's London mayoral election. On my right uh, is Sean Berry, uh, the Green Party London Assembly member and former party leader. And on the far right, no, uh, not necessarily politically, is Lucy Fisher, Whitehall editor of the Financial Times. Uh, you might want to ask the panelists about what we've been discussing in the last hour, police seemingly cracking down on Just Up Oil activists in a more forceful manner. Uh, more than half of train services across the country being cancelled again today, with drivers in the Aslef Union out on strike. Ministers increasing the financial support for childcare for families who get universal credit. AI experts warning the tech they've dedicated their life's work to could end up wiping out the human race. Plus, you're welcome to ask them about anything else which is on your mind this evening. And don't forget, you can watch Cross Question live on Global Player. So call 0345 6060 973 or text 84850. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross Question. Watch on Global Player. This is LBC. So let's go to Brian, first time caller, very warm welcome, Brian, in Newmarket. What's your question? Hello. Well, I just read reports that an RAF recruitment email talked of, quote, useless white male pilots, end quote, hoping to recruit more people of colour and women. The UK and the USA are destroying themselves by woke madness, which seems to be growing daily. Would the panel agree? Well, this is Sky News has obtained a leak email which highlighted useless white male pilots. It's an interesting question, Brian. Thanks for raising it. Yasmin Alibi-Brown. 
Well, I don't know why you should be alarmed by it at all. Um, for generations, both here and in the United States, certain occupations have been more or less wholly white. If change is coming, that's hardly woke. That's just fair, right. And it, of course, they should be good enough. But it's incredibly kind of um, interesting to me that every time these changes are announced, people stick on the label of woke as if that immediately turns it into a madness. It's not. It's how the world should be and is becoming. And on this show, for the first time ever since I've been on, there are four women and a very able white presenter. Is that the end of the world? No. Is that woke madness? No. I thought I was Asian. I've now just been turned white. I, I, no, I didn't say... My... Did I no? say white? Yes, you did. I didn't mean white. I didn't mean white. Sorry. Sorry. I know I'm quite fair, Yasmin. I'll take it as yeah, a compliment. I'm very I'll sorry. <laughs> but, but, Yasmin, just one thing, because we had, I think it was the um, the head of recruitment, wasn't it, at the RAF, if I remember correctly now, who resigned on the back of this mm. policy of recruiting uh, people from ethnic minorities, and ultimately, should it not be the best person for the job? And I mean, ultimately, you want people who can fly the planes, can't you? So you can tell me, hand on heart, that every white person who's been appointed male, who's been appointed by the RAF, has been superbly qualified, all of them, and that all the others are not qualified? I mean, what kind of... There are failures in appointments. Every single institution appoints, and people are good or people are bad. But what has happened has been kind of almost unconscious replication of the people who are already there. That has to change. Susan Hall, fair point, isn't it? No, why bring the colour of their skin into it? I think this is absolutely appalling. How dare they be rude to any, uh, any amount of people? How dare they be rude to anybody? It's totally unacceptable to call anybody that. I think it's... I could not disagree with you more. But I didn't defend the terms. I'm just saying the principle is right. I don't think anybody should be abused or insulted. But Do you the not find that insulting, though, to Jesus. actually put that in an email? To actually even We're think not that. talking... We're, the, the wider point is there needs to be some change. And it's OK to say that about white no, I didn't men, say that, it? did I? No, I'm asking I said, you. No, it's not. No, I've it never used right. an abusive term for anybody white, black or brown. Good. Well, I don't know why the colour of their skin has even come in. Well, I'm this. sorry. If you were brown, colour of the skin comes into it all the time. Well, I'm sorry, but to it actually does, write... It does, like an, it or not. Well, to actually write an email like that, I think... Yeah, but how, is that what we're talking about? Feel, are we talking about the rudeness of the email or the principle? Okay, how would you mm, feel? Susan, how would you feel if you were a white male? I would feel absolutely threatened by the fact that the world is changing because the world has been in mind for such a long time. It is absolutely correct that we try and get more people from different backgrounds in different jobs, 100%. It's also correct that we try and make sure that we have a representation of women, 100%. But that should not be uh, on, on the back of putting such things out. Uh, of, no, that's, of, you're right. Of, I, I'm, I'm not defending the email at all. I'm defending the principle and the yep. change. Hey, you. Sean Berry, what do you make of this email? I mean, there there is obviously a a stereotype out there that is based on some reality that that a, a RAF pilot is a is a upright white man, and and that does need to change. Any institution where you've got a preponderance of one group becomes dangerously insular, can create a culture like we've seen in the police, like we've seen in the fire brigade in London, which is it's not inclusive and can lead to bullying, can lead to cliqueiness, all kinds of problems within institutions like that. So seeking to diversify is a really, really but good Sean, thing. Shouldn't it, shouldn't it be based on whether the uh, individual concerned can actually do the job? I mean, look, I was in the RAF cadets at school. I didn't get f further than flying a chipmunk. Yeah, in I mean, every, in every case, we want all our pilots to meet certain standards. Yeah. Um, but that does not mean that, that, that an institution where apparently the best person for the job is always a certain kind of person is not an institution no, I, 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 I that you. has problems. Yeah. And diversity brings benefits of its own. We know that from from rules um, in Europe that bring um, more women into the to the boardroom. Um, the the benefits there have been in I think it's been it's been probably quantified in the 
the Welsh government where the proportional system means there was for a while equal numbers of men and women in that in that institution and a much wider range of topics were discussed on a much wider range of terms there was innovation going on in that in that parliament mm. because of the diversity that was there and and it's important that we do things in the in the fiercest way possible um, the fiercest language possible you, we can debate that but but certainly people mm. need to be clear this is what we want to change because this isn't good enough Lucy Fisher well, look, I, I don't think anyone um, would want to be either admitted to the Air Force or promoted on the basis of their skin colour or their sex. Mm. To me, I think you want as far as possible for it to uh, remain a meritocracy, people being promoted on the basis of their capabilities. But what I do think is really important with the RAF or any organisation that traditionally has only um, recruited from one sector of society, that initiatives um, are started and pursued in earnest to make sure that... Um, the, that a diverse range of the population is being advertised to, that mm. communications campaigns are reaching communities that maybe have been overlooked in the past or don't have representatives um, who uh, who become symbols um, that younger people look up to. Lucy, you were formerly defence editor of The Times and obviously there was a big drive to try and get uh, more female uh, participation in the armed forces. Would you have a view on that and how that worked or where it got to? Yeah, look, I, I think it's been um, in large part a real success, but that happened over um, some time. There were some sort of painful aspects to the way that was introduced, but by and large, I would really um, applaud the way that the, the British Army um, has pursued that without lowering standards, because again, it comes back to um, some of uh, the women, and you know, the MOD has put on days down on Salisbury Plain, where as a reporter, I was invited down to meet um, some of their, um, you know, uh, incredibly formidable um, female warriors. You know, they don't want to be um, looked down on or, or bullied or derided as tokenistic promotions. So in some cases, uh, I think um, there has been uh, appropriate acknowledgements and adjustments to criteria made to acknowledge the differences in female biology, but without undermining um, the ability of all male uh, regiments to fight, or if they're in introducing women, that that isn't damaging the fighting power of the army, which of course is at the core of what it's there to do. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Brian, that was a great question. Thank you very much for getting us underway. Uh, Matt in Brighton sent in a text saying, do the panel believe that the Just Stop Oil protests are justified? And if not, is their answer because they do not believe we are in a climate crisis, which is believed by some to be apocalyptic, or rather that there is no justification for protests of this sort? We've just been discussing that in the last hour. Um, Sean. Well, um, the right to protest... <laughs> it's appropriate is, I come to you first I mean, on this the, one. The right to protest and the protests that are going on at the moment from, from Just Stop Oil are... They're adapting constantly to the changing legislation, which is trying to stamp out, as far as I can tell, protest of any kind. But we hear this, is that, it That really? would achieve change. They want us to just like do things in the most polite way that they can safely ignore and that is not how protest works that is not how campaigning for change generally works you do need to have people um raising issues in ways that are disruptive in order to get the attention of people who would like to ignore facts like we are in a cri climate crisis we are doing nothing like enough to avert what would be an existential problem for the entire world now there are people on the streets are feeling that very, very strongly. They're feeling that because um, they may work in those areas, they may feel it because they are they are doctors, they are scientists, they have children who are going to grow up in a world that may not support human life in future. These are these are really serious issues and the fact that, that these people are out on the streets shouldn't make people angry, it should make people sit up and ask why there are people who feel like that. What about the people who want to just go to work? Yeah. Well, there are, yeah, there are lots of things that will get in the way of your getting to work. The sheer weight of traffic caused far more delays to people getting to work than, right. than anything that just stopped doing that? right now. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I really don't. Uh, everybody has got a right to protest. I completely agree with that. But everybody doesn't have a right to ruin other people's lives and to cause the mayhem on the streets that they do. It's the same as Extinction Rebellion. It, it's all very well if you, if if you you can agree with what they're standing for, but hard-working Londoners are trying to get to work or to the hospital or to see relatives or whatever else they're doing, and they should have a right to be able to 
go through the streets to, to get from A to B without being stopped by these protesters who who are causing absolute mayhem, and, co well, costing us an absolute I fortune mean, in policing. The, the tactics being used at the moment are very, very far short of mayhem. They are um, gathering attention for sure. And I, you know, I absolutely think people have a right to complain about it completely. But what about the lady I don't think the government a, has a right to change the law to stamp out protesters. Sean, what, about the lady, what about the lady in the Range Rover, famously, who couldn't get her kid to school and then got 20 days community service for nudging a protester? Not that I'm, not that I'm saying that that was the right thing to do. That was an incredibly do, dangerous action, was, I think, an course. appropriate it, um, Obviously, she was frustrated, and I'm not defending it, but to get her kids to school. I'm Lucy. sorry, no, oh, can, sorry, can I, I just want to ask, on, yeah, come, come. do you think the suffragettes did a good thing, getting us the vote? Yes, and this is the argument. No, no, that can I ask you if you thought th that their th tactics were out of order? Uh, <laughs> this is what it constantly comes yes, down to. Yes, and she's an important no, 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 question. No, no, no. You it, can't no, say no. we have the right to protest, but then don't protest. No, you Do you have... know, if I was younger, I would be gluing myself onto the street because it's that important. Always to say you have the right to strike, you have the right to protest, but don't dare do it. No. What kind of a right is no, that? But don't, don't wreck other people's lives. If people want to get the on with their lives and wrecked they want to get everything and want to until get on. they got but Yasmin, the vote. But Yasmin, the, the suffragettes also uh, committed illegal acts yes. and terrorist acts. Would yes. you endorse that? Yes, I endorse everything that was done because we got Including the vote. Including letter bombing politicians. We got the vote. It okay. was not an easy or clean oh. fight. We got the vote. The four women here got the vote. Lucy. I've actually written um, a biography. I know you have. <laughs> Emily Wilding Davis. I, I, I gave it a plug before you even came oh, in. Fantastic. Glad to hear that, um, Ali. I, I do think there's a slight difference between the age and then where the difficulty of gaining attention uh, um, for the cause and the ease of w with which now people can disseminate information about climate change um, is slightly different. But for me, it, it, when we step back a, a, a bit and look at what Just Stop Oil's actions are, even if they were enacted tomorrow mm -hmm. and, and the British government did stop all further licenses um, for oil and gas, this is a global problem. Um, but actually, I'm quite optimistic because, to my mind, the only thing that's going to really um, solve the problem we have with fossil fuels is when a cleaner, cheaper form of energy is created that is taken up by the main polluters in the world, who are the coal users of China and India, um, and, but, and, and but, some other nations. And yeah. in actual fact, the UK is at the forefront. British scientists of new technologies like nuclear fusion made a huge leap forward last year. There's other um, options on the table like green hydrogen. I, I just think the, the the horizon on which Just Up Oil are looking is is too narrow and, and isn't and isn't going to solve the problem. Yeah, they are making a to. really simple demand. And and the thing is, the government is is looking around the country for new licences it can issue in the North yeah, Sea sure. for, for exploration for new fossil sure, fuels. And that you, is the opposite. But let me ask you this question, because you're obviously a leading member of the Green Party. You've been the leader as well of the Green Party. How do you solve the issue of baseload power? That the fact is that the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow, you need to have baseload power. Either you need to solve the issue of battery storage or nuclear, you need to have some baseload power. So you're either going to import it, and this is all virtue signaling, isn't it? Well, I mean, storage is the main thing storage that we, is that we, we absolutely need to yet, solve. We? We, are, we are opening new factories for batteries. We are looking at new ways to do storage within the UK. Like you say, we've got the, the, the ability to come up with the right but answers we're not there yet. To, for a diverse, and stable and reliable grid that will actually serve all our needs. And, and don't forget, we also need to be cutting the amount of electricity and gas that we use. We are so far behind every single country that I can think of on insulating our homes. And so groups like Insulate Britain are making similar simple demands that well, will take us a long way argue, along the way to deal with some some of these practical some issues. Some people would argue we're not there yet, but... Uh, uh, that's a, a topic I think that's going to keep running and running. It's not going anywhere. So you can see we've got a sparky panel here this evening. I knew that there'd be, <laughs> it would be an interesting discussion. You can hear that already. If you want to get your question or text into our panel, uh, call 0345 606 text 84850. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 818. This is LBC.
Ask Question on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. It's 8.21 on LBC. You're listening to Cross Question. I'm joined by my panel uh, this evening, uh, Susan Hall, uh, the Conservative London Assembly member, Yasmin Alibi-Brown, the author and commentator, Lucy Fisher, a Whitehall editor of the Financial Times, and Sean Berry of the Green Party. For our next question, we go to Craig in Glasgow. Good evening, Craig. What's your question? Good evening, Ali. Um, my, my question for the panel this evening is, um, are the government and the Prime Minister taking the COVID inquiry seriously anymore? Or have they already decided to equip Boris behind closed doors? Now, a spokesman for Boris Johnson says he's now passed all of his messages unredacted to the Cabinet Office and has called on the government to now pass those messages on to the COVID inquiry. The government has been given an updated deadline of tomorrow afternoon to forward those messages by the inquiry's chair, Baroness Hallett. Lucy Fisher. Well, look, for me, this is really um, wrangling that is more about how government is in part run by WhatsApp these days. And I think there is this blurring of the line between the way in which ministers uh, and advisers communicate with each other about um, official business, uh, government business, and how the same people use the same devices and the same social media app to communicate with their spouses, their kids about personal matters. Right. So just to be clear what the government is saying, it's saying it wants to redact information that is of a p purely personal nature and a, and avoid handing over things it claims are um, unambiguously irrelevant to the inquiry. But of course, I think it's a, a very obvious principle of justice that it shouldn't be for those taking the witness stand yes. whose activities are being investigated to be able to self-select what should and shouldn't be um, redacted. So, you know, bearing in mind that we have to remember at the centre of this inquiry are the bereaved families, people who, who lost loved ones in the pandemic and how important it is that the inquiry um, retains the trust of the public and is seen to be transparent um, and have full access to materials about decision making in the pandemic. I do think there is you know, huge pressure on the government to bow to the um, chair Baroness Hallett's demand for it to hand over all, um, all information unredacted. Susan, that's a fair point, isn't it? It should be unreal. It should be up to the uh, co committee chair, the COVID inquiry chair, to decide what's relevant and not relevant. Yeah, it's a difficult one because um, I summoned some documents recently for the um, for the police and crime um, committee, and it was Detail. perfect. I <laughs> know it, it was all around something that Sadiq had done that was right. very bad, as usual. Um, so, but. Lots of uh, there were lots of junior officials mentioned in it, and that was redacted so that their names didn't go into it, and um, and that was considered right and proper that it would do. But I will say that it's absolutely important that there is transparency. I do agree with that, but sometimes you you do protect junior members of staff and or if there are family members. So it's a difficult one. I appreciate that. Yes, and what do you make of this? I don't buy a word of that. Actually, you I think it's a cover up. No, I, I do think that it's, and it's not about Boris anymore, I think. It is about, there's some things that they don't want to hand over, whatever it is. And I don't believe for a minute it's the love letter they wrote to their girlfriends or wives or whatever. It isn't that, because they're not on the same what groups anyway. The lovers probably have different <laughs> WhatsApp facilities. Um, so... I think this baroness is not going to let them get away with it. And if it's true that they will take this to court, then there will be no trust in this inquiry. None at all. Well, how long will it take to go through? I mean, you're thinking about the amount of uh, WhatsApp messages and documents that have to be gone through. We're hearing it could take up to seven years for this inquiry. By that stage, will it will it make any difference at all? We might have another pandemic by I then. don't think so. I think these are just things they're putting out. This judge is a very kind of smart, authoritative and um, a, a sensible woman. And if she says she wants the whole lot, give it to her and then she will deal with it appropriately. That looks like it's been handed over now. Uh, Sean? Yeah, I mean, I, I am I am pleased that the um, inquiry are asking for absolutely everything here. Because after all, I mean, these are... This was an extraordinary period of history, a period of history that has really hurt a lot of people. A lot of people are feeling totally betrayed by the way that apparently um, members of the government were, were 
disregarding laws that they were sticking to, to the letter, in ways that were incredibly painful to them. All of this does have to come out, as well as some of the other issues around the way that government became incredibly casual and, and to do with... You know, I'm not. I'm trying not to libel anybody, but to do with you know who you know and 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 millions and millions of pounds but, of, but Sean, of public was, money went yeah. out in a way that was incredibly casual but, over WhatsApp. And they, those things do need to be released. Sean, it was a very acute situation. Mm. The government would say that they had to act very quickly, and yes, mistakes of course were made, mm. but they had to act very rapidly. And, and they people, should like, expect to be honest about what happened. And and to some extent, I think the public will give them leeway for mm. having to act in a in a quick way, but not in a way that's corrupt, not in a way that betrays what everybody else was yeah, trying to do to save lives. Yeah, I lost my sister to COVID, mm. right. and I could not see her or go to yeah. her funeral. Yeah. All right? Mm. I cannot forgive this lot for what A lot did. of people will feel the same. Mm. Lucy? All I was going to add is, you know, I, I've been reporting on this, so I have um, also spoken to um, a number of ministers um, who served during the pandemic era who themselves are frustrated at the government's position because they say they would be happy to hand over all their own communications. Um, and some have urged the government to take a nothing to hide, nothing to fear uh, approach. So I think we've also got to acknowledge that there are many in government who say look it was an unprecedented uh, situation but by and large we did act in good faith we did the best and you know to try to you know to, to get things right so it's not everyone within government that, that wants this redacted uh, approach to continue although of course some they want to be open about it Craig uh, Craig in Glasgow just to come back to you uh, briefly on this uh, you've heard what the panel uh, think about it what are your views yeah listen I just think that it's all Ridiculous. I think the government are, are very much in a situation where it's kind of like, well, we'll cooperate with this, but begrudgingly, because I would not, you know, if I was under investigation by the police for talking sake for anything, I, as the person under investigation, wouldn't have the privilege to decide what information they do and do not get because I don't think it's relevant or not. Um, and it just, it feels like even if, you know, it's not overtly that, the optics of, of it look like it's just more cover up, um, and I think Sunak clearly has a vested interest because although he might say he's fresh and new, he was Boris's number two in command basically as Chancellor when this was going on. Um, you know, so he clearly could be damaged by this as well. Um, and I, I honestly think that it's it's not good enough the, the behaviour from the government, and you can't pam it off as something that doesn't matter because it does people. Yeah. Lost yep. loved ones, people couldn't be there for them, so it does Indeed, matter. indeed. No, I think it's a fair point, uh, Craig, and I think also Rishi Sunak, as you say, is under some pressure because he did come in and say that he would clean up government. He was coming on the back of uh, all these uh, uh, well, the in ongoing inquiries and investigations into Partygate, which still uh, seem to be rumbling on. We'll hear from the Privileges Committee very soon. So you're listening to Cross Question on LBC. I'm joined by my stellar panel here. If you want to get a question into them, then call 0345 6060973, text 84850. We'll be back uh, just after the uh, news in a second with Serena Farrow. The ex-Prime Minister says he's given the Cabinet Office all of the material requested by the Covid inquiry, including WhatsApp messages and notebooks. Boris Johnson says it's had access to the material for several months now and is urging the department to hand it to the inquiry, which wants it tomorrow. The childcare industry has warned it won't be able to cope with the government's latest measure to offer more support to families. From the end of next month, those on universal credit will be given almost 50% more funding. Ministers say it will help people get back into work, but the sector says it doesn't address issues around staffing and vacancies. And British officials have been described as a legitimate military target by a former Russian president. Dmitry Medvedev has criticised the UK's support of Ukraine Ukraine following a drone attack on Moscow yesterday morning. LBC weather cloudy in the east and far north tonight, spreading westwards, staying pretty clear elsewhere, though breezy in the south, with a low of five degrees. This is LBC.
Cross Question on LBC. Text 84850. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's just gone 8.34. I'm joined by my stellar panel, Yasmin Alibi Brown, the author and political commentator. It's really nice to see you, Yasmin. I've been a huge fan for a long time. Uh, Susan. Don't you say that to all the girls. I... <laughs> <laughs> you know it's true. You know it's true. Uh, Susan Hall, uh, Conservative London Assembly member, who's also... Susan, you're going for uh, Mayor of London? You're going to pick I up am indeed. Hurry. When does the process end? When do you know if you're going to win or not? Uh, well, we go to down to three on the 11th okay. of the month, and then whoever is chosen will know Confident? on the 19th. I'm always confident. <laughs> you know that, Ali. I'd make Excellent. such a good mayor. Excellent. you <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that the the uh, selectorate will uh, will come to the same conclusion. Sean, are you going to stand for Parliament again or not? Um, well, I've stood for mayor three times, so you good luck, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the best things to do, standing for mayor of London, because you get um, to challenge you know, the, the main parties on on a really big platform as a, as a green. And you know, London is is such a, an amazing city and, and a region in its own right. We have so many good powers where we can do really innovative things. You can come up with some really good ideas mm. and put them across during that campaign. And not, not, you're not standing for Parliament next time? You're not sure? No, no, no I'm, I'm standing okay. for the Assembly again okay. next year. Fine. Um, you're happy I'm hoping good. to, to yeah, continue uh, to challenge whoever whoever is mayor, whether excellent. that's a green or not. Excellent. And Lisa, you, you, your latest book is out as well, uh, on women in war. Yes, very kind of you to The last heroines of uh, Britain's greatest generation. Sounds fascinating. I'll get around to reading that very, very soon. Um, so, let's get on to our next question. Mark in Kilburn says, recent polls are showing more and more people believe Brexit was a mistake. Despite what Keir Starmer has been saying recently, do the panel believe that whoever wins the next election, the UK will inevitably need to join the European Single Market and Customs Union to allow growth to increase? And this is on the back of Keir Starmer, who's written a piece today for the Daily Express in which he said the nation's key economic problems can all be fixed outside the EU, inverted commas, and that's why we should be optimistic about post-Brexit Britain. Lucy. Uh, no, look, I, I think that there is still a sense that um, all the uh, major political parties are still smarting from the divisions of the original um, Brexit wars, and uh, I don't think it's going to be uh, a really a key issue heading into the next general election. If anything, it, possibly the election after that, 2029 odd, could be a, a moment where, depending on the circumstances, people could talk about things like single market or customers union membership. I think Labour's been pretty clear in ruling that out. There's no appetite among Conservatives. Even the Lib Dems, you know, have really, you know, stepped away from cleaving to sort of pro-EU policies because they saw that there was no kind of uh, electoral um, uh, benefit in doing so. So for me, I think this is a settled issue for the moment. Keir Starmer has spoken about um, re, uh, reappraising the Brexit deal. We knew there was a renegotiation coming up in 2026, so that's not him um, uh, threatening or pledging, depending on which way you see it, to do anything that wasn't already going to happen. But I think he's also been pretty clear this doesn't involve single market or customs union membership. Sh Sean, is it settled? Because <laughs> the, Gre the Greens were very, very open about wanting to remain. Yes. Do you think it's back on the table? We, we're, we're the party that's been absolutely consistent all the way through this. And I think, you know, I think you said at the beginning there, the majority of people think that Brexit was a mistake. And and the economy agrees with you. You know, we have, we're have we one of the only countries not to return to pre-pandemic levels of, of trade. The customs union is causing, the, the lack of being in the customs union is causing an immense drag on our economy. The the, the lack of Europeans coming to work is, is causing immense trouble for our public services. People can see that and they agree and the Greens have a, a pragmatic policy of of rejoining uh, the customs union looking to to align everything that we can on social and environmental policies so that we can we can win align with the EU on those and to do more to reintroduce freedom of movement so the only party that's actually being open and we want to talk about rejoining at right. the right time yeah. right so the only party thing so it was all a mistake Susan no, and I, I do agree with Lucy. I mean, I knock on doors all the time. I don't get this anymore at all. The only people you get this for is is devout remote rem, remainers, um, and they will just constantly bring it up. We're moving on. People are talking about the cost of living far more now. That is what is affecting people. And we, we've left, and hopefully we will remain Having left. Susan, in London, London is a very voted Remain as a city. Yep. Are you telling me that your uh, chums on the streets of Harrow, where you were a councillor, really don't care about Brexit? I mean, is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's not, if, you, if you knock on the doors, 
They do not mention it's Brexit. cost of living. It is the cost of living. Uh, anybody that knocks on doors, it's also my bin hasn't been collected. <laughs> Indeed, I mean, well. down to, to, to that yeah. level. But no, it's not discussed anymore. Right. We've moved on and we must move on because it was so damaging to so many of us. So many families fell out over Brexit. Uh, it was damaging altogether with people so polarised on... Do you think we've years. got the Brexit dividend yet? Uh, it, it will come. It will come. It will come. Yasmin doesn't look I'll convinced. Be Yasmin. I'll be dead by then. <laughs> and I don't want to be dead. No, and this, the, these three, uh, you know, certainly, um, I haven't followed the Lib Dem position, but certainly the two um, main parties are now completely dissociated from the views of the population, which is absolutely survey after survey. So I really disagree with you, Lucy, that this is done and dusted and we're never going to have to deal with this. People are now beginning... So talking about knocking on doors, I'm not a politician. I knocked on two doors near where, in where, where I live in Ealing to talk to them about Brexit. And I was very open. I said, I was a Remainer. I don't know how you voted. What do you think now? And they wanted to talk and they were talking. And many of them were saying, I made a mistake. You can't ignore that whole swell and just carry on as Keir Starmer is doing mm -hmm. and um, uh, Rishi Sunak is doing. You yeah. can't do that in a democracy. I'd really like to see the re response to the, the things that Keir Starmer has mm -hmm. been saying today amongst Labour voters. It's all very well telling your party to shut up about it because you, you don't want it to be talked about. But but Labour people, Labour voters on the doorstep must be bringing that up with, with people yes. that don't I'm sure the doors. They are. And I think if, they, if they're doing their focus groups like they do, I'd be really interested to be a fly on the wall there to see what happens. Yeah, well, that's that's my point. I'm not saying, I'm not taking a view on wh whether the country at large thinks that, but I'm saying that I think in within the main parties, there is yeah. a view that um, it, for Labour in particular, it's a real wedge issue. And when it comes to immigration, yeah. part of the core you know, arguments of Brexit. I think it's it's painful for Labour. There is such a, um, a, a, a chasm between, um, a schism between different views on different wings of the party. That, that, I don't trying think to they can shut down debate, it. those parties. It, it, Lucy, is that because they're trying to win back the Red Wall and they know that if they push this issue very hard, they will scare off the voters who left them last time? Yeah, in, in, in short, I think that's um, that's pretty much the nail on yeah, the head. Yeah. Can I just say that the thought of Yasmin Alibi Brown knocking on my door to get to oh, canvas my view on Brexit, charming. I would be delighted if you knocked on <laughs> my door, Yasmin. Excellent. Let's go to our next question from Ben in Clacton. Good evening, Ben. Good evening, Ali. Good evening, panel. The question is, was James cleverly wise to say that uh, Ukraine had within their rights to send drones outside of their own territory? Now, let me just give you a bit of context here. The Foreign Secretary was in Estonia earlier this week and said that Ukraine has the right to project force beyond its borders to undermine Russia's ability to project force into Ukraine itself. This followed a drone strike uh, on Moscow, an attack which Ukraine has flatly denied being directly involved with. Susan. Um, I imagine James would have taken advice before he actually said that anyway. Um, I do have sympathy with what he said. Um, if you look at the aggression from Russia, it has been quite, quite dreadful. Um, just how long do the Ukrainians have to sit there like sitting ducks waiting mind you they have said that they weren't responsible for yes, those drones in any event so um you know <laughs> if they're well. not if they're not they say they said they were pleased about it uh well of course they would be pleased if any anything was uh inflicted upon the russians because of what's happening to them but i mean they they said that they didn't have anything to do with it and so i think he was just passing a comment Lucy, former defence editor, but do you think we're in a proxy war now with uh, with Russia? Well, look, uh, I think there's just a little bit more context that's really Please. important to point out with James Cleverley's comments. Um, actually, Susan, I don't think he was prepped for this. Watching mm. the press conference, I think he was slightly caught on the back oh, I foot. Didn't see it. Um, mm. So he was answering a question that was asked about the um, the drone strike on this Moscow residential neighbourhood, and in fact, he made clear he w couldn't comment on that. Um, but he said the general principle was that Ukraine did have the right um, to uh, project force beyond its own borders um, on the grounds of self-defence targeting military installations. So I think that's a really key point. He was saying that, you know, he backed Ukraine to use its own weapons to um, attack, as it has done. We 
know it's you know uh, attacked mm. kind of uh, Russian um, weapons de depots um, just uh, over the border into Ukraine. So mm. it is slightly more specific what he's saying, and it is mm. very different from endorsing mm. what would be a war crime, which is an attack on civilians. But Lucy, let me ask you this, because uh, obviously throughout this process we have supported Ukraine quite rightly, but it's been a creeping commitment. So firstly, we were agonising about tanks, then we're ag agonising about. Um, planes, the US has now signed off uh, that allies can give planes. Now, if a plane were to be in a situation where there was a direct attack on Russia, what kind of situation would we then be in? Well, well, let's see where we get to that. I mean, so far, there has been a very clear delineation between what Ukraine does with weapons donated by the West, which are only for use within its own um, borders. Yep. And frankly, I think that they, I don't think it's likely that they would betray that promise because, you know, frankly, if the West withdrew the withdrew its support, Ukraine would lose the war immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what it does with its own weapons, which is a little bit more of a, of a fuzzy line. So I, I let's see when these jets, you know, it's if they are delivered, how yeah. how yeah. The, the terms that yeah. bind them. Yeah. Yasmin. I just don't think he's very clever. And he's in. he's got a job, he's not clever enough to James do. cleverly yeah. is not clever enough. Yeah. And you I heard it here first. What makes you say that? Well, because he's a Tory. No, no, no. There no, are no, some very, very why. clever Tories. Go on, there Yasmin. are very clever Tories. Go on, Yasmin. Rishi Sunak is a clever Tory. James cleverly is not. Because? Because he's just not got any depth. And I think this is a job that, at the moment, in the way the world is, we are really in such a fragile state around the world with, you know, wars happening here, there and everywhere. It really needs somebody who, who, can, who can think in a much deeper and complicated but way than Mr. Cleverly that? can. But what's your evidence for the fact that Well, because not... I've heard him and watched him and witnessed him throughout his miserable little career. And actually it's really this is a dangerous thing we need somebody better to be the foreign but, but, secretary but better in what sense because the government like line i said is somebody who can who but the can, government line is uh, yasmin that they are supposed they're running out of good people that's the problem isn't it they they really need somebody very very sophisticated deep thinking uh, and able to put the pieces together. I'm sorry, line, I do not yeah. think Mr. Cleverly does that. Well, the government line is a government line, Sean, isn't it? I mean, it is an incredible, I mean, you're right, Yasmin, it's an incredibly delicate diplomatic situation. So every single word that our diplomats mm. and, and cabinet members say is interpreted in a very, you know, precise and, and forensic way. And it is incredibly important that people are, are, are careful. We are backing Ukraine in an important defensive war in a way that's very carefully set yes. out. And so to accidentally go beyond that is incredibly dangerous. But I mean, thank goodness it's not Boris Johnson in, in the Foreign Secretary's yes. seat right yes, now. Yes, I do think he's better than Boris Johnson. It was chaotic <laughs> the in record. the extreme, by all accounts. <laughs> well, yeah. well, for some people that's not particularly hard, but not to be controversial. We've got Susan here as well, may take a different view. Uh, Absolutely. Interesting discussion on that particular one. You're listening to Cross Question. Uh, get your questions in. Uh, you've still got time. 0345 60973, text 84850. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 847. This is LBC. The Elizabeth.
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross Question. Tweet at LBC. You listen to Cross Question on LBC. It's 8.50. I'm joined by Yasmin and by Brown, Susan Hall, uh, Sean Berry and Lucy Fisher. The next question is from Alex in Enfield. It's a text question. Uh, what would the panel do about the ULES extension considering it's set to negatively affect some of the poorest in London. A bit of context here. London's ultra-low emission zone is set to expand to include the whole of the capital at the end of August. Before it can go ahead, the expansion will face judicial review launched by five Conservative-led local councils, four London boroughs, Bexley, Bromley, Harrow, Hillingdon and also Surrey County Council. I've got to come to you, Susan, on this first. Yes, I would stop it straight away. If because? I mean. Uh, because it, it, it's just nothing but a tax on hard-working Londoners um, who cannot afford to replace their vehicles. The the venom against this in outer London, it, I've never known anything like it. And it's because people are absolutely desperate. They cannot afford to do this. And how much is it going to cost them? Well, in some cases, they just can't afford to replace their car. How much uh, yeah, is indeed. another car? Because there's £12.50 it's a 12 day, plus a day. the car itself you've got to... Yes, that's right. Absolute, and they yeah. just can't afford to do it. I spoke to two pensioners the other day. They'd got cars that they'd had that they were hoping to, quote, to see them out. They couldn't afford to replace them. They didn't know what... They don't know what they're going to do. And that was in Enfield. I went to a, a ULES rally in, in Enfield. This... It's all very well in inner London when mm. you can just walk and get a bus or um, a train from from literally no distance. In outer London, it is quite different. Do you think it's going to cost him the election, Sadiq Khan? Well, the you thing think is, this could be the issue. I, I, it, the, the venom out there from Labour voters, absolutely. It, it, it's a real thing. I would stop it on day one of being the mayor. There's no question about that. But the trouble is, if he puts it in in August, the damage will be done. And it's not just that, though, Ali. It's also so many tradespeople that vans don't comply. They live slightly outside London. They're going to go and do their work at outside Indeed. London. They're not going to come into us. Plumbers, builders... Etc. Well, Sean Berry from the Green Party has really been containing herself very well. She agrees Sean. with me. You know you Susan, agree with me. Susan, no. Sean, no. Yes, no. You do. The Assembly voted to expand the scrappage scheme that goes alongside the ULES. But but honestly, you and you and the Conservatives cannot be trusted with London's how much health for and, our, and our efforts to deal with climate change. Sean, just, just for the listeners, how much do they get for scrappage? Do you know? Um, there's, there's a grant of, of some thousands of You're pounds. Right. It's more for, for people who are disabled mm. and small businesses can claim as well. But the overall funding for the scheme isn't enough to cover the, the number because, of people who because, might need because, it. But, 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 but we need this policy. We need this policy. It's important to get policies like this right, but it's important to get these policies in place. I'd have introduced a London-wide ultra-low emission zone from the start. I wouldn't have gone halfway and then all the way to the edge gradually. I'd have done it from the start and I'd have done it alongside a proper scrappage scheme and alongside better public transport. Sean, we're in the middle of a cost of living bad. crisis at the exactly. moment. So how do people, how can people afford to change their cars right now? You have to have the, the help for people on low incomes and you have to have improvements in public transport. I've done research, I've asked people in outer London, do you feel forced to own a car? And a quarter of them say yes, those people mm. need help. And I'm, you know, I'm writing to those people at the moment, asking them to tell me which of their journeys make them feel like that. And I want to make, I want to get a picture of the kinds of new public transport we need for Outer London. Mm. There's no reason why well, it's also, Outer London public it's also, transport shouldn't yeah. be as good as for another. Well, it's also not just a London issue. It's also in Glasgow now, they're introducing a low emission zone. It comes into force at midnight tonight. All vehicles entering the city have to meet certain standards on air pollution. Makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, well, yes, Yasmin? because we know no. the research. I mean, I live on a main road. And, 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 and I've lived in the same flat since 1978, never moved. And it, when we bought it, it wasn't a road with a lot of traffic. It now is part of the South North Circular. And I had no idea until I saw the research, and very relatively recently, that the reason my, my children and I suffer from asthma, which I, didn't, I wasn't born with, I didn't grow up with, was the result of living where we do. And now we've kind of got new windows and so on. The house is less polluted. We didn't know this would be the effect. Mm, mm. It's a difficult one. Uh, Lucy? Yeah, look, I think the evidence is that it's damaging um, 
uh, from people's health, particularly on, on young lungs, but I also am um, sympathetic with people who rely on cars, mm. trucks for um, personal travel, work, um, yes. their, their businesses. And um, I think, you know, the idea would be to have a support scheme, this, an expansion of the scrappage scheme that would allow people to um, retrofit or upgrade their vehicles to meet the um, criteria that are coming in. I want to fit. Can, yes, can I add that I think it's also the government's mm. responsibility to provide for a scrappage scheme that supports people who live outside of London, Should and that is one of the in. demands of the, the legal well, challenge uh, that you're making. And I there's think there's a lot that of fiscal pressure be, at the moment. That should be a judgment uh, against the government. Should not go in. I want to. I just want to squeeze, if I can, a couple more questions in. This one here is a text question from Chrissy in Leeds, who says. Al Pacino, the actor, is going to become a dad again. He's 83 years old. Is this morally outrageous or are you relaxed about it? And just to give a context here, his 29-year-old girlfriend, Noor Al-Fala, is currently eight months pregnant. He's already got three kids, aged between, in their mid-30s and uh, early 20s, I think. Uh, another Italian-American movie legend, Robert De Niro, looks like the Godfather cast here is all, <laughs> this is all the rage, <laughs> uh, recently became a father for the seventh time at the age of 79. And Formula One boss, Bernie Eccleston, also is in the same uh, bracket as well. Lucy, what do you make of this? Well, look, it's not illegal, but does it make me feel a bit queasy? Um, Yes, frankly. And if you look at, frankly, can they p perform a, a, a role of parenthood into the, the foreseeable future for that child to become an adult? It, it's mm. unlikely. So um, I find it a little bit odd, such huge age gaps. And when um, the father is quite so old that they're possibly unable to see their own children grow up. Sean? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good point. But it's, it's their private life. I'm, you yeah. know, it's up to them. I, I've no comment to make. <laughs> We agree with each other. I knew <laughs> at some point that would happen. <laughs> yes, live and let live, I say. If that's what they want to do. Imagine if it was a woman. If a woman at, of 60 gets pregnant, uh, you know, in whatever way, and sometimes once in a while a story breaks, there's outrage. OK, I should think. And I mean, it's almost like it should have been a plot in succession, could it? Logan Roy's <laughs> latest squeeze could have been pregnant. And then imagine the ending. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> let, me, let me try and fit one more uh, one in, which is from Stefan Trafford. This is meant to be a fun question. Uh, scientists in Norwich are developing peas which don't taste like peas. Which other popular food would you like to change the taste of? The more controversial, the better. Susan. Celery, I'd make it taste like chocolate, and I could eat loads of it and put on no weight whatsoever. Very good. Yes, yes, man. Baked beans. Baked beans, why? I can't bear the taste or the texture or anything of it. So if it What would you make them taste like? Something more nutty and crunchy. <laughs> Sean, are you? Uh, what would you do? I, I agree with Susan. I don't like raw celery at all. Um, but yeah, also the the the. The, the fake chicken that you get that's vegan. Yes. This is the reason why they're you developing vegan? these peas. Yeah. I try and eat as much okay. alternatives yeah. to meat as possible. Yeah. Um, and some of them are great. I think the alternatives to chicken that you can find, are, like why would you why would you kill a chicken when you can have that? Um, but the, the alternatives to bacon are really poor. And I don't eat bacon anymore and I can't eat that either because it's terrible. So I would make those taste better. I think. Okay. I do have uh, I do have veggie sausages a lot, actually. They're pretty they're, good. They're, they're, they're different. They're, they're different styles right. and they're pretty, yeah. pretty good, actually. Yeah. Lucy? Well, mine would be on the on a lines of veggie food as well. I've not eaten meat for about 20 odd years. Oh. And I used to love the old fashioned yes. veggie burger that was just a bean burger. Yes, bean yes. You can. And so what I yeah. want to see unengineered is these new meat like textures, which um, to me are just too much like the original. Uh, and I'd like it to go back to the old fashioned. That is actually a very good point because everything is now engineered to taste like meat, which seems a bit yes. odd if you're a vegetarian. Yeah. Why would you yeah. want to taste something that yes. tastes like meat? It does seem a bit yeah. odd. What a fantastic panel we've had. I knew it would be interesting and lively, and it certainly has been. And very warm uh, thanks to uh, Yasmin, Susan, Ashan, and Lucy. Great panel. Thanks a lot for all your input. And thanks also for all your texts and questions as well. Now, coming up after the news, something very interesting, which is that the head of the National Trust has opened the door to the restitution of its colonial artefacts, raising the prospect of Clive of India's treasures being returned. Now, René Oliveri said the organisation, he's uh, the interim chairman, said the organisation is preparing a policy which will look at the provenance of items in its collection, balancing that against the public benefit of keeping them in the UK. The Trust has got a collection that includes a thousand items brought back from South and East Asia, a lot of them sitting in Powys Castle in Wales. I found this absolutely fascinating. And the question I've got for you is this. 
Should the UK return its stolen colonial artefacts to their country of origin? On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, Boris Johnson says he's given the Cabinet Office all of the material requested by the Covid inquiry, including WhatsApp messages and notebooks. The ex-Prime Minister says it's had access to the material for several months now and is urging the department to hand it to the inquiry, which wants it tomorrow. The childcare industry says it won't be able to cope with the government's latest plans to get people back into work. From the end of next month, families on universal credit will be able to claim almost 50% more support. But the sector says it doesn't have the spaces for increased demand and there are wider issues that need solving. Early years and childcare lead at the Women's Budget Group, Sarah Ronan, has told LBC she has concerns. By our calculations, the government would need to recruit an additional 38,000 staff into the early year sector by 2025 if it's going to deliver on this. It feels a little bit unrealistic and the reason it feels unrealistic is because we have an an acute recruitment and retention crisis in the early year sector at the moment. So turnover in the sector is double what it is in the rest of the labour market. There's a warning that Europe's biggest nuclear power station in Russian-held eastern Ukraine is a catastrophe waiting to happen. Two workers at